Modern physics tells us that the world is very different from what it seems. Our intuitions have evolved on Earth, and so we've taken the conditions of Earth to be commonplace. It was a reasonable inference from the available data, but it turned out to be wrong. Earth is very strange. It's strange in just the way that is necessary for biological life to evolve, just far enough away from a star so that the temperature on the surface of the planet maintains liquid water, and near just such a star that contains gas injected with the heavy elements from exploding supernova. And we shouldn't be surprised by this cosmological coincidence. Where would we, as biological life, find ourselves but in a region of space hospitable to life? As we are able to see, through better technology, greater expanses of our universe, we are beginning to get a picture of our cosmos, which encompasses much more than simply planets and stars, although these things are particularly interesting to us. The inhuman and inhospitable nature of our universe can make its study seem irrelevant to our daily lives. This is not true. In this video, I will give an outline of the scientific advances which led to our best current cosmological model, a multiverse so vast that sheer probability dictates that if you travel far enough, you'll eventually run into a planet identical to the Earth. I'll then make my own argument, that if this model is true, the logical and natural consequence is that we are all one in being. Not in an abstract sense, but in the very literal sense that we are all part of the same conscious entity. The Double Slit Experiment We've discovered that all matter and energy display the dual characteristics of particles and waves. The double slit experiment, or Young's experiment, demonstrates this. If we take a device which projects a constant stream of particles, say electrons, and aim it through a plate pierced by two parallel slits, then the electrons passing through these two slits interfere just as a wave traveling through water interferes with itself. This interference leaves a pattern on the wall behind the plate. This makes sense in the case of the classical wave because interactions can take place through the persistent medium of water. But it doesn't make sense in the case of electrons, which we know to be discrete particles. Perhaps interactions happen between the different electrons which cause the interference pattern. To test if this is the case, we reduce the stream of electrons to timed individual shots. Despite the fact that no two electrons are being shot at the same time, over a large span of time, eventually the same interference pattern will appear on the wall behind the plate. When we shoot the electron, we know that it is alone. When the electron hits the wall, we know it is still only one electron. Matter and energy must be conserved. But in between, when it isn't interacting with an observer or a wall, the electron acts as though it is part of a wave. The mainstream explanation of this is known as the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that while it doesn't interact, matter takes on the form of a probability wave. The electron in transit exists as a diffuse wave of probability, and upon interaction, collapses into a single outcome. There is a competing interpretation developed by Hugh Everett, the many worlds interpretation. Since Everett could see no mechanism for wave function collapse, he worked out a mathematical explanation which posited the real existence of all possible outcomes. Because we are creatures limited to three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, we can only experience one out of the many outcomes which happen with every interaction. So, in transit, the electron is a probability wave, as is the nature of matter, but also when it interacts, that same probability wave interacts with the whole wall. Only there are many individual timelines which split to account for the various individual particle interactions. The consequence of this is that there result an enormous number of parallel space-time universes with countless branching timelines. At every moment, whatever you might potentially do, you do in some branching timeline or another. I encourage you to research the matter for yourself and see which interpretation you find compelling. The Inflationary Big Bang Model The standard Big Bang model goes, in short, as such. 13.7 billion years ago, a singularity of infinite energy density underwent a very rapid expansion. Over the past 13.7 billion years, this expansion resulted in our observable universe. There have been several problems not explained under this model discovered in the last 50 years. I'll discuss two. The horizon problem. 
The early universe was extremely hot. It glowed so brightly that it was completely opaque. As space expanded, the energy-matter density lessened, and the universe proceeded to cool. This process still hasn't completely finished. There's a cosmic microwave background radiation which permeates the universe. Looking out to the farthest distances possible, those distances just after the opaque period in the universe, we can observe that background radiation. What we find is that the thermal equilibrium between opposite sides of the universe is consistent to one part in 10 to the fifth power. The light from those distant regions is just now reaching us. Since the Big Bang, those regions have never had any interaction. So why is it that they are in such consistent thermal equilibrium? The flatness problem. Einstein showed that matter and energy curve space-time. That applies at the small and large scale. This means that the large-scale universe must have some level of curvature between hyperbolic and spherical. A flat universe is only one seemingly random possible state on this continuum. It would be extremely unlikely that we have just the amount of matter necessary for a flat universe. Despite the unlikelihood, when we measure the curvature of the universe, we find it to be flat. Inflation as the solution. In order to resolve these and other problems with the Big Bang model, Alan Guth in 1980 proposed the theory of inflation. If there is a vast inflating background in which singularities form, become trapped in a false vacuum, giving them time to achieve thermal equilibrium, then decay into a true vacuum, this very rapid background inflation force, which may have something to do with dark energy, would cause the flattening of space to the degree which we currently observe. Under this model, a vast inflating vacuum could, through quantum fluctuations, give birth to singularities which would expand out to form a vast number of causally disconnected bubble universes. These universes are theoretically distant from us in space, but practically they are inaccessible as they move away from us at faster than the speed of light. Matter and information are limited to the light speed, but as far as we know, space itself is free to expand at whatever rate. As far-fetched as it sounds, this cosmological picture is consistent with our current best understanding. String theory also has its own multiverse, which includes a preposterously big cosmos, although I'll leave that research to you. So, I promised an argument following from these models for our oneness of mind. Our personal mental experience has a robust physiological explanation, yet, ultimately, we are epistemologically disconnected from the physical world. We can infer its existence from our experiences, but we can never really access the physical world in our consciousnesses. The room around you, I'm sure, exists but what you see is a mind-generated image. Actually, most of it isn't even based on up-to-date sense input. Your brain constructs what it expects to see. That's why many optical illusions work. We are essentially computers which take various sensory inputs and synthesize a continuous experience that we call our self. This self is a function of that physical body, just like software is a function of a physical computer. From our perspective, as that software of self-experience, we can never know if the apparent physical apparatus, our bodies and brains, really exists, or if our software is being run on something else that we have no evidence for. And here's where the multiverses come in. If those scientific models are correct, then there is other hardware which could run your software. There is other hardware that does run your software. Every element of your personal experience is duplicated countless times because we know that there must be countless copies of your physicality which undergo the same sense data experiences that you have had and will have. Now, if it is possible for a biological computer to run your consciousness, then that represents a generalized proof of concept for the ability of computational systems to run human consciousness software. As long as the physical possibility exists, then, given that the aforementioned scientific models are right, it will happen somewhere. Any possible human consciousness timeline is going to be actualized somewhere. So what? There are many copies of you and everyone else out there. What does that have to do with you? Well, there is no way to differentiate the experience of your consciousness here on Earth or on any computational system out there in the multiverse. 
The software experience is identical. Unless you believe that you have a firm soul or identity that persists absolutely, and if you believe that, then a scientific or logical argument isn't going to persuade you, then you are just the accumulation of your experiences. The fact that your cumulate experiences exist in many duplicates means that you exist running on many systems. They are not duplicates of you out there. They are you. You are a thing which runs in many places, just like a text document is a thing that runs in many places. Let's extrapolate this out a little further. It's not just your software that runs out there, but all possible human software. As long as there is no intrinsic, inviolable computation limit preventing it, then combinations of distinct human software must also run. Combinations of all human software, or even all conscious software, must run, as long as there is no physical limit to that type of computation. Imagine a large meta-consciousness which remembers the individual experiences of all its components. If I'm right, then there's a huge mind out there which remembers being you, and me, and everyone else. That mind would be identical to you, in that it runs the complete you software, just like all the other duplicates, only it is also much more. From this perspective, all conscious entities have an experience of one another, are one in being with one another. A limited consciousness is a possibility which must be expressed somewhere. So that experience must be had. Your individual life must be led. But ultimately, when your individual experience ceases, there is also a unified consciousness that you inhabit.